Hello and welcome to the Tech in the Hood podcast. I'm your host, Ahmed Flex Omar. Tech in the Hood is a storytelling podcast that explores the past, present, and future of Chicago's cultural identity through conversations about community and technology. Each week, I reconnect with the friends and mentors who have shared this journey and spotlight new voices and innovators building the future of the tech in the hood. Welcome to the first episode of Tech in the Hood. And today with me, I got my buddy, Sean Michael Warren. Sean Michael Warren is a fine artist from Chicago. And Sean, introduce yourself to the podcast. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Michael Warren. I'm an artist born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I've been an artist for as long as I can remember. So, yeah, my interest in art started at a very young age. You know, sure. I was four years old and um, between, you know, watching cartoons all the time and then, you know, really getting into comic books, you know, that was something that really, really drew my interest a lot. And growing up, I wanted to be an illustrator and, you know, just emulating the things that I saw on television. Do you still want to be an illustrator? Uh, in some (laughs) aspects I kind of am, but I do like the lane of fine art that I've taken, you know, the art of portraiture and creating narrative works of art. Um, but it's fun to do, uh, every now and again, it's something that would do more so from a leisure standpoint. Uh, I've gotten too uh, uh, too knee deep into into fine art and, and and creating portraits that you know that's just the lane that I've I've chosen for myself and want to continue in and continue you know improving in sure. uh, as an artist. But you know, my mother she was an artist growing up, and you know she was raised by, she was raised by her grandparents, and they didn't think that fine art was something that was worth you know going into as a career. Mm-hmm. They figure, oh, you would probably be struggling for most of your life, so choose something else. So there was a compromise. I mean, she she chose uh, she chose architecture and interior design as her mm-hmm. career field, and she'd been in that for over thirty years. Um, but when she saw it in me, she said, "No, you know what? I gotta I gotta help him cultivate okay. this because." I mean, I don't want to make the same mistake my grandpa, uh, my grandparents made. So she, you know, she was there to, you know, help me, you know, grow it and to, you know, um, uh, encourage it. And it has led me on a path that has been very, very interesting and very life changing in a lot of ways. Uh, so, yeah, um, art has been my thing for forever and it will continue to be. So do you go by a the artist Sean Michael Warren or the fine (laughs) artist. (laughs) You know, Um, honestly, I really don't get caught up in the title too much at all. Um, I'm a, I'm a creative, I'm an artist, you know, whatever people label me as, I mean, that's, that's what I am. I mean, it's, um, we well, gotta own your own narrative. You can't let people leave. Oh, that's you. true. But in terms <laughs> of being a creative and artist, I mean, generally I go with artist okay. or, or fine artist, um, muralist culture. I mean, that word kind of encapsulates a lot of different things yeah. that I do. So, um, primarily artist is the main thing that I, that I go for. So, okay. Yeah. So earlier, uh, you talked a little bit about your uh, childhood, right? Mm-hmm. And you mentioned, uh, Disney and, uh, beauty and the beast. Mm. Um, any other uh, cartoon inspirations, you know, at that at that young age? Definitely the Marvel and DC shows. Okay. So growing up, um, Fox Kids was like the biggest, like mm-hmm. uh, uh, the biggest thing during the uh, the early and mid 90s. So they had a lineup of all these Marvel shows. You had X-Men, you had Spider-Man, you had the Avengers. Right. And uh, that's where, you know, I got a lot of my inspiration from, you know, growing up. So I would always copy you know, characters from uh, from the Marvel series and then the DC series. I was a huge fan of, you know, the animated Batman series that started in the early 90s. Um, of course, you know, Superman. And also, yeah. you know, I got into anime during my preteen years, you know, with the introduction of Dragon Ball Z in America. Like that was the thing. Mm. So um, a lot of these uh, images, you know, they, they really, really captivated me a lot. And I started to like, you know, do a lot of drawings and, uh, illustrations, you know, just, um, just from that. So I actually still to this day have a lot of those, uh, those drawings and, uh, um, really? oh yeah. Oh yeah. I have a portfolio of like, uh, preteen Sean that's stashed somewhere that's still, you know, it's, everything's still in perfect condition. You know, these are drawings from like, God, maybe 25 years ago uh, okay. or longer that I still have. So, all right. Yeah. Well, uh, our friend, we're not going to name him, a famous director who's listening. 
<laughs> I just discovered a treasure chest uh -huh. for the documentary that you didn't initially mention, but this mm -hmm. is why we do podcasts. So you learn something uh, new. Yeah. Um, now, does anime, you know, inspire you at all, you know, as a young child? Or It did. You mentioned Dragon Ball C, so I was curious. Yeah, for sure. You know, anime, I always thought, well, Japanese anime was was so superior to uh, a lot of the animated uh, series in the West. That mm -hmm. was just, that's just my opinion. But, you know, a lot of those shows seem to be so far advanced with, you know, its illustration and its animation, mm -hmm. uh, the way the characters were drawn, the way the environments were created. And I love backgrounds and sceneries. Like, that's my, that's yeah. my thing. Um, so I, I was always... Um, watching not just to enjoy the storyline of the show I was watching to see the skill that went into animating, you know, uh, a series, you know, like a Dragon Ball Z or, yeah. you know, maybe the Gundam series that had been going on for decades. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was just, to me, it was, it was superior. <laughs> hey, that's, that's Siri. I can't control her, you know, but Siri's she, always listening. It's all good. She, <laughs> she's my mom's best friend now. And, mm -hmm. and she talks to Siri more than she talks to me. So yeah, so. my folks is Alexa. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I tend to argue with Siri sometimes. So, uh, you know, that's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's all good. So Siri don't interrupt us again. Anyways, <laughs> um, that being, uh, you know, said, there is a process, you know, for like, um, animes and cartoons, you know, to mm -hmm. be developed from like just images, you know? Mm -hmm. So were you aware of the technologies that were used? Yeah. And I, honestly, um, I tend to still like the earlier days of how things were done, mm. uh, not just with animated films, but even with um, films that required a lot of special effects. Yeah. So during the, uh, you know, the 70s and 80s, uh, a lot of the films, let's say, let's use the Star Wars um, original trilogy, for example. Sure. A lot of those backgrounds are matte paintings. Like these are paintings, hand paintings on glass. Really? You know, that, yeah, it was, a, it was a really cool process. And there are some documentaries that are still out there on YouTube about the process of matte painting and how you know, you know one you can drop <sighs> mm. i think it was from lucasfilm or industrial okay. light and magic either either one of them but there was a, a team of matte painters that actually worked on these very elaborate you know super realistic you know pieces that you know most don't know like that was the actual like backgrounds for like the empire strikes back or return of the jedi and they would actually paint on glass like actual glass and then, you know, the way they would set it up on a camera, it was, it was just really cool how they were able to fool the eye and to make you think that they were in these really immersive you yeah. know, worlds and, yeah. and scenes and uh, sets. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I loved the original way of doing things just because I'm, you know, I'm a huge lover of, you know, just, just skill. You know, we've, we've come into a really big digital age where everything can be done, you know, digitally, everything can be done on Photoshop or illustrator and design, mm -hmm. um, you know, 3d max. There's so much software that's out there now that makes things a little, um, um, uh, quicker because the demand for things have uh, increased and like the, the time in which it's allowed for artists to be able to work on projects has shortened. So, um, you go from, you know, the hand drawn, you know, uh, frame by frame, yeah. uh, uh, pieces that artists would do for like, a, an, uh, an animated film, you know, in the, the golden age of Disney, you know, sure. in the sixties, you know, so, uh, everything is, has crossed over. In fact, it was beauty and the beast where the, where digital, uh, art was first introduced into animated film. Really? Yeah. Yeah, fun fact about Beauty and the Beast. You're just um, dropping nuggets over here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, it's interesting how things have evolved over time. Yeah. Um, you know, as an artist, even you know, for me, I'm I'm very uh, traditionally trained and and you know, working from life and you know, working on. Um, um, working from models, you know, from life people that pose for you or, you know, creating a, a still life, you know, from, you know, observation, the still life is right next to you yeah. and you're having to draw exactly what you see, uh, make the correct, uh, and accurate measurements and, you know, replicate that on, on paper, on canvas. Um, but over time, uh, you know, there have been devices that have come along that have really aided in me being able to, uh, to create work. Uh, the big thing, unfortunately, is that I don't uh, have access to people, you know, like that where, you know, I can have them commit to hours on a day to just posing for me, yeah. you know, for a piece. So I have to use photography. 
And photography is like the primary asset to a lot of different artists, especially, you know, fine artists that are doing works, you know, whether they're portraits or, you know, multi figurative works of art, they're, uh, they're utilizing the camera. It's, it's basically the standard for us now in terms of, you know, being able to develop, you know, a, a, a piece and, um, what's, what's your favorite camera brand? Ooh, I would say, Hmm. For images, I would say Canon. Um, uh, for video, I would say Sony. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I would, I would, I would make those two distinct. <laughs> yeah. uh, they, they, they both are are great cameras, but in terms, of, you know, video. I mean, Sony has been incredible as of late. Mm -hmm. um, but Canon is really good for for images. I'm a highly detailed person with my work, so sure. you know, getting those really really fine details. I mean, the pores and the skin, those really fine hairs on on a person's face or on like maybe on their hands and their arms. Like, you know, um, Canon has always been you know really good for that. So uh, I would say the two of them have been really really uh, really really great to work with. So did you have to take uh, courses on uh, photography? You know? uh, unfortunately. Uh, I did not get to take the photography course that was just introduced at the school that I attended uh, here in Chicago. It was the uh, American Academy of Art. Okay. And by the time the uh, photography course got introduced, it was my senior year mm -hmm. and I was already on my way out. So I wish I could have taken it, but everything I have learned has been through tutorials or expert, you know, professional photographers that I have uh, either befriended or, or come across over time. So uh, I'm still learning. You know, you use YouTube at all? Uh, of course I do. YouTube University, <laughs> one of the best <laughs> educational resources. If yeah. you if you if you see it that way, um, but yeah, YouTube has definitely been a help. But you know, learning from a person that actually has been in the field and they're expert in the field, and you know, their craft is you know impeccable. You know, I think of you know a friend uh, Darius Carter, the Carter's Touch. Sure, he's a he's a prime example of that, and he shoots for. I don't know how many celebrities I can name, but Man, Darius uh, is a beast. Oh yeah, he is. He yeah. is absolutely shout out to Darius. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I would say photography is what, like one of the primary tools that, uh, I and many other artists use when creating portraits, um, pretty tough to have someone pose for you. I mean, there are places that still do that, especially ateliers that still, you know, uh, teach how to draw and paint from life. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Florence Academy of art, which I attended, uh, back in 2008, uh, was one such atelier, for example. There's actually Wait, one hold, hold, hold up. You attended the Florence what? Florence back, Academy of Yeah, back up a little bit. Tell us about that. <laughs> uh, so my school here in Chicago had a special relationship with the Florence Academy of Art to where a senior uh, or someone entering into their senior year could actually apply to be a part of their intensive drawing uh, mm -hmm. a course for a trimester. And uh, during my junior year, I had uh, put a portfolio together of my best life drawings. And uh, they, I ended up being accepted along with another uh, uh, student. So the two of us were, were accepted. Um, and we, uh, we learned how to draw, you know, basically from life. What they, what they do is they start you off with a long pose with the, uh, with the figure. Mm -hmm. And then uh, during uh, the other half of the day, you actually draw a cast drawing. You know, um, you have a, either a cast drawing or a bark. You're creating a copy of a, a Charles Bark drawing. So yeah. Charles Bark, quick, uh, quick history lesson. Charles Bark is considered one of the standards when it comes to drawing. And his okay. drawings are, uh, of cast are absolutely uh, incredible. And he's, uh, he's the blueprint for how to draw accurately in a lot of ateliers. So where is he from? What? Uh, I can't remember where Charles Bark is from. This is centuries back, actually. Centuries so, back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just for the audience, we're talking mm -hmm. about Florence and Florence, Italy. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. That's Florence, Italy, birthplace of the Renaissance. Yeah. Yeah. How how did you feel when you first got there? I mean, com coming from it was uh, it was an outer body experience. Mm -hmm. You know, it was pretty surreal. I mean, I studied about this place and the history surrounding this place for most of my life, and then to end up there and to actually walk those same streets and to study in that same place, it was really. Did you study um, where Michelangelo studied, or Da Vinci, or any of those? Guys? No, 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 no. They. <laughs> 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 no, no, they studied. Uh, actually, their their studies were were a little bit different because sure. you know art was one thing, but also they studied philosophy. They studied you know multiple different things in addition to art, and a lot of what they studied you know in art and uh, and philosophy and and religion, all of that you know bled into their work. So mm -hmm. they were very brilliant you know artists you know and 
even though they were very young, they were very, you know, very, very uh, uh, brilliant philosophers at a young age, you know, and they were yeah. ahead of their time. So, um, but no, 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 no. I, I, I wish I could have studied the same way they did. Uh, I would be a completely different artist, I think, if if I did that. But, but why would you say that? Uh, because they had nothing but time to create. Mm. You know, they had nothing but time to to you know uh, perfect their craft. Um, the only thing that stood in the way was when uh, you know they were being flooded by other commissions. You know, Michelangelo is one example of that. Where you know, while you know. Over the course of the time where he was supposed to do the um, uh, the tomb of Pope Julius, uh, he was interrupted by other commissions that that uh, that happened so much so that uh, Pope Julius ended up dying, and he didn't get to actually do the the tomb until about forty <laughs> years later, and it was only a shell of what the original concept was. They had mm. you know dozens of figures planned out. And uh, it had to be reduced to something that was much more manageable for Michelangelo, especially as he was getting older. Sure. So, um, yeah, they had nothing but time. And for us, you know, uh, artists, a lot of artists are not like, you know, well paid. We don't all have patrons. We don't have people financially backing us. So a lot of us have to do other things in order right. to finance that primary thing, whether it's, you know, a nine to five, whether it's Uber driving, whether it's, you know, uh, taking on, you know, a series of different gigs, you know, that we might necessarily want to, uh, we might not want to do, but it, um, it helps, you know, finance what we really want to do. So they weren't interrupted by, you know, you know, life. And, you know, mm -hmm. life being expensive and the struggles that have come in, in the modern age, you know, um, yeah. Making they, art is not cheap. It is not cheap at all. It, it costs you and not just monetarily, you know, it, and if you really, really want to do this thing, I mean, it costs sometimes friendships. It costs, you know, being able to go and have fun and being able to, and that's only if you're really, truly dedicated to, mm -hmm. uh, to the craft and want to get to a certain place, you know, on a success level, whatever success looks like to an individual. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very costly, you know, and I, I say that as someone that has made a lot of sacrifices to get to where I am now, you know, being able to, um, you know, make those difficult decisions and say no to this event or no to this friend's party. And, no, yeah. and it's not personal or anything like that, but you know, um, yeah, it's tough. It's really tough. And, you know, there are not enough hours in the day. We have so many ideas that we have in our mind and you know just trying to get one out sometimes is very difficult and very time consuming and it takes a, a lot of time to actually get that out so uh so yeah you know a lot of us all we want to do is to be able to create but at the same time too we want to be in a position where we don't have any other concerns, you know, uh, when, when it comes to life, you know, those things are already, you know, taken care of and we can actually dedicate that time to, to creating. That's why yeah. I love patrons, you know, they're mm -hmm. the people that, I, that support artists, the people that collect their work, the sure. people that, you know, um, you know, finance, you know, whatever endeavor they want to enter into in art. I mean, they are, they are godsends, you know, for us. And it's, um, it's hard also too, when you're competing for, you know, like grants or fellowships, because, you know, you have maybe a dozen grants and then you have like thousands of artists competing for the, like these dozen grants that are out there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it helps when there's patronage, you know, people that are, you know, behind us, you know, uh, it really helps to create a process. It helps us put something out that is needed, uh, in the world or needed in a specific community or, you know, just generally telling a story or highlighting, uh, an individual person in a, in a portrait or, or so on and so forth. I mean, it's, uh, it's important that we have that and we have more of that. Abs abs absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, uh, when you make your millions, you're going to be a patron or how is that going to work? <laughs> I would love to be a patron and to, and to reach back because, yeah. you know, there are a lot of artists that, you know, they have some really, really great ideas. They have great work. All they need is just that backing. They just need that support. So, you know, an artist of myself being in that position to do that, I absolutely look forward to doing that. And I want to collect my own peers. You know, mm -hmm. I want to have their work in my collection. And, you know, whenever I start building that collection. Um, but yeah, I want to support other artists. I mean, that's important. There are a lot of artists that 
that need it, you yeah. know? And um, it's why I, I, I can't understand why certain artists that do make it do not reach back, you know, at all. They they think in the long, along the lines of, well, you know, there's not enough here. So I have to safeguard this because you can be a threat to my success or, you know. So, yeah, I mean, there are artists that don't even want to share techniques. They don't want to share their process behind how they do what they do. And it's like, you know, why? You know what? Yeah. I mean, it just, it, it doesn't make sense to me, but you know, for someone that knows what that's like to actually have to spend years struggling to get to where I am now, like reaching back is, is almost like a duty, you know, to, to do so. Absolutely. I mean, you also, uh, do public art, right. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit, you know, about that? Mm -hmm. I think there's a famous, uh, piece of yours in the West loop. <laughs> so public art is a different ball game and it is one that is both mentally and physically taxing. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're going to get into public art, it is a, it is a monster. And, and those of my colleagues that are in public art and that have done like really incredible murals or, or sculptures, they know, they'll tell you like, it is, it is not for the weak at all. Um, and it's not just dealing with um, you know, you know, trying to create this, this, you know, gargantuan, if you will, or this, you know, really elaborate, you know, public piece, you're also dealing with people that are not, that are not artists mm -hmm. that are trying to call the shots and, you know, trying to, uh, make these demands that are oftentimes unrealistic. So, uh, so all of that, in addition to actually trying to successfully, you know, create something, you know, on a public landscape is it's, it's difficult. It's difficult. So, but yes, to, to, to what you, to what you mentioned, I do have a mural of, um, uh, the famous Oprah Winfrey in, uh, the West Loop of Chicago. And for those that, uh, do not know West Loop was where the Harpo studio, um, uh, Harpo Studios was located uh, on Randolph during yep. the time of her uh, during the time of her show. And mm -hmm. back then, if you came to West Loop, that was the only thing you came to West Loop for because it was <laughs> it was a really shady area. It was a meat packaging district. It was, mm -hmm. you know, it was uh, not much going on there at all. That was the only thing you came out yeah. to the West Loop for. Yeah, I'm and heartbroken that it's only Hamburger University. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not, not this in McDonald's. If they yeah, I don't, decide to be a sponsor on the show, but uh, <laughs> I don't know why they. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know why they didn't yeah. keep it. To be honest with you, could have been a museum. You know? It could have been. It yeah, could have been a pil because pilgr a pilgrimage. I mean, I'm an immigrant. You know, so mm -hmm. um, but growing up my um aunts would you know if oprah came on that yeah. was it and you were all the way in in the middle east didn't matter she's she's, oprah, she's, she's the know? original influencer yeah this is pre-social <laughs> media days pre, and pre internet yeah pre-internet the days technology even. that she relied on mm -hmm. is different from you know technology that's used i mean the technology we're using you know right now you know and that's also a testament to chicago i mm -hmm. mean it wasn't just oprah it was the bulls the 90s bulls i mean michael jordan and oprah winfrey were two of the most polarizing figures out of the same city yeah you know this is pre-internet this is pre-social media but for their reach to be global during that time says a lot it says a it says a great deal so i never understood why they didn't keep harpo studios it should have been a historic landmark yeah uh, i mean were, i don't even see an oprah statue there was, there was nothing to commemorate her whatsoever. Okay. So when we were on that project and the way it was presented, um, the, um, the developers that were, you know, creating port, which is where it's located, mm -hmm. uh, John Buck, Lynn Lease and intercontinental, they were on board for it. And it's the only thing that commemorates her in that, in that area. There's not even a placard anywhere. You know, that was, that was the thing. So, nah. um, yeah, we developed peace during uh, during COVID. It was uh, during the summer into the fall of 2020. Uh, myself and uh, Jane Barthas, uh, Anna Murphy, mm -hmm. uh, Callan Strauss, uh, we were we were part of this um, this this elaborate project. It's actually the largest standalone mural in the city of Chicago, um, and it's it's a cultural landmark. So. So yeah, that's, that's one such mural. And that's actually one of only two murals where I've collaborated with, with another artist or other artists, uh, yeah. um, you know, more than one artist. So, uh, the other was in Bronzeville, which I did that same year mm -hmm. earlier in the year with, um, with another artist by the name of, uh, uh, static, uh, we collaborated on a project for ComEd, 
and uh, this organization out of Miami called Before It's Too Late. Mm -hmm. And they are an organization that helps uh, commission uh, public works of art that deal that speak to, you know, our environment. Uh, so for this piece, they wanted to f focus on climate change, but they also wanted to acknowledge the history of Bronzeville. So the way the mural is designed, is almost in like a timeline format. Yeah. So you have historic figures that are on one side, which is what, what I did. And then sure. static has what the present and the future of Bronzeville can be, but acknowledging climate change and, you know, uh, just initiatives that can be done to, you know, help, um, help our environment mm -hmm. and, uh, using alternative methods of energy. Uh, so yeah, it was a well, very- We're recording this show for Black History Month, right? So mm -hmm. people that are listening that have yeah. no idea what Bronzeville is, can yeah. you shed a little bit of light? Uh, Bronzeville is a historic black community in uh, the city of Chicago. There's a lot of rich history in, uh, in Bronzeville. Um, uh, what's the gentleman's name? Actually, I did a portrait of him for the University of Chicago Law School, uh, Earl B. Dickerson. Uh, he was the first African-American uh, uh, JD graduate from the University of Chicago Law School in 1921. His um, his life insurance company was actually in Bronzeville, um, Supreme Life, which was on 35th and King Drive. The building is still there to this day, actually. Um, you have the monument to the soldiers that fought in World War One. That's right there at that corner as well. It's actually in the in this median that's uh, that's on King Drive in mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Thirty Fifth. Uh, Doctor Daniel Hill Williams' uh, practice was also there uh, in Bronzeville. Um, he was the first black doctor to successfully perform open heart surgery. That his practice was there. Louis Armstrong, um, Louis Armstrong's career started in Bronzeville. So it's a very the, rich the history. Louis Armstrong. The Louis Armstrong. Yes, his career started in Bronzeville. So very, very rich history there in that uh, in that part of Chicago, and uh, the mural is you know hopefully uh, something that adds to that rich culture and history. Uh, to uh, to uh, to the city, so it's really incredible. So, question for you, yeah, going back to the tech part of this, sure, sure. Um, do you use any software? Do you use what do you use in your process, and that's related to tech when you're doing like public art? So, primarily, I use uh, I use Photoshop. Mm -hmm. um, so here's here's my process or try to give a quick version of it um, when it comes to putting a mural together. So the wall is multi, you know, if it's multiple stories tall, and, and usually they are, uh, what I would do is I'll get the entire scale of the wall itself. You know, I would, you know, uh, use either um, a laser to measure the, the height and width of a wall. And uh, what I would do is I would take an image of the entire wall itself. Sure. So I'll upload the image into Photoshop. I'll take those exact measurements um, of the uh, of the wall. I'll actually expand the file size to well. Sometimes it makes the the file way too big, but I try to expand it to the size of the um, of the actual uh, of the actual wall. Or what I'll do is I'll use math and divide. You know what it could be at a lower scale, at a smaller scale. So You're the file an artist, size. You use math. Of course I do. Interesting. Especially in public art. Um, okay. Because here's the thing, I only have one opportunity to get this right. Mm. You know, I can't make the same mistakes I make on paper on canvas because it's public art and because it's acrylic that I work on, which is a fast drying medium. I have a very, I have very little room for error. So you don't have an AI assistant? No, I do not. <laughs> it's all, okay. it's all math. And part of this comes from, you know, my, uh, the architectural and, and carpentry background that I have from my mom and dad. So, sure. um, but no art. Um, and math, I mean, yeah, they do go hand in hand and, uh, I definitely use a lot of math when it comes to creating murals. Yeah. So one such example would be the, uh, Dr. Maya Angelou mural that I use, uh, that I created in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. uh, in South central. So that was only two stories, uh, two stories high. However, um, I was working on the mural indoors. I use this, you know, parachute cloth, um, that I, um, that I sometimes work on when I'm doing a mural. So, uh, what I had to do was to find a way to, um, um, accurately measure what the, um, what each individual tile was going to be. I reduced into like a, a grid. So, uh, once I did that, uh, I was able to make my cuts. And then once I fit it onto the wall, I mean, everything was, was, was perfect. So, uh, the thing with public art is number one, you're dealing with unrealistic, uh, deadlines. There are people that want you to create something super elaborate within, 
a very, very short amount of time. Um, so we don't always get leniency in terms of uh, timeline. So we have to find ways to, you know, to shorten, you know, our process. So um, between, you know, Photoshop, you know, using that gridding system, or in some cases, maybe doing a smaller drawing and then projecting that drawing onto the wall, it helps reduce that time because if I tried to do it the way I would work on a canvas, I would be there forever. <laughs> um, so yeah, those are some of the the ways that I utilize, uh, um, you know, uh, some tech, um, especially for public art, because like I said, it's, it's really, really, uh, it has to be really, really precise or at least close to it. Otherwise, like I am, I am screwed and yeah, <laughs> I don't, I don't ever want to run into any issues, you know, uh, like that to where I'm okay. I have to ask for an extra two months because I did this wrong. You yeah. know, can I, <laughs> yeah. So I try to avoid that altogether. So that's why, you know, I am very, very, uh, keen on, you know, accurately measuring the scale of the wall and then also sizing the, uh, the portrait that's going to go on that wall. Right. And then also when it comes to using that particular fabric, I make sure I make those cuts correctly. So when it fits, especially for um, walls that have windows, you know, and that's one of the only murals actually that I've done that has uh, windows on the wall, you know, the Maya Angelou mm -hmm. mural. MLK will be the other one in Los Angeles, but um, yeah, that one required the most uh, math and the most use of tech. And also too, with Photoshop, um, there's a, there's a tool that you can use where you can actually, you know, it's like an eyedropper tool. You can actually, you know, pinpoint what a specific color is. Yeah, yeah. So that actually helps me in creating and mixing all of my values. Um, I like a, a premix of all the colors I'm going to use for a particular mural. So, um, yeah, it's, That's it's really, a cool. really, yeah, it's, it helps a lot and I'm not guessing. Like I know exactly what I have to mix to make this specific color. Yeah. And then, you know, even though it may not make sense, it may not look like it actually is the color that's supposed to go there. Sure. When it's all put together, it's, yeah, it's it flawless. Saves, it saves you time. It saves a lot of time. And like I said, with public art, you are not given a lot of grace when it comes to time. So you ha artists have to find ways. Some artists just, you know, um, some are really good enough to just, you know, just, just sketch everything out with a, with a, with a, uh, with a spray can. And yeah. just completely spray paint the whole thing on. I mean, there are a few that are like that. Um, Royal Dog is one. Uh, Mr. B Baby, she's another. She She's incredible. And she does it like, you know, like it's nothing, you know. Mm -hmm. But for more so for me as a fine artist, um, I want to, and because I'm very, very precise and don't want to, you know, make any like, you know, uh, visible errors, you know, I, I work that way. So, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So another interesting point is uh, you recently uh, joined a uh, program, with the State Department, Art and Embassies. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so art, artist as a diplomat, you know, mm -hmm. it's an article that was dropped. Yeah, that was dropped. Uh, we're coming up on what, almost a year since that yeah, article was yeah, dropped because yeah. yeah, yeah. So the art and embassies, uh, program was created, I want to say during the Kennedy administration. Uh, and it was, it means 60th year this year, 60th. Yeah. yeah. Is it'll be the 60th anniversary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. So it was, uh, it was created as a means to use art as a form of cultural diplomacy. Uh, funny enough, I was having a conversation, uh, uh, earlier today and I was saying there are four things that are universal that will always get us to like, you know, no matter where we're from, we'll all, we can always have a conversation or bond over it. And that's art, that's mm -hmm. sports, music, and food. Mm. So, um, art, and actually this has been going on for centuries. Art has been used as a form of diplomacy. You know, artists were, were diplomats and, you know, um, they would send artists to, you know, different embassies and have an exhibition. Um, you know, it, it's, it's something that has been very effective throughout time. And I think we tend to forget about the role artists play outside of just creating work. You know, we, we've, I think we've pigeonholed artists into one specific thing. Oh, you're an artist. You're going to have a show at this gallery. That's it. You know, your work sales are very cool, but no, like in terms of the political landscape, and this is why I don't understand when people say art and politics don't miss mix <laughs> they've been mixing forever yeah. i mean this is this is nothing new i mean all. cartoon propaganda you know yeah for sure art was one of the biggest the tools day. for propaganda <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, and still is, still is yeah. and still is but you know yeah. people respond to art 
you know, and actually, um, I think of, you know, different instances where I've been in exhibitions inside of like, uh, like a consulate, for example, like the French consulate in New York. Yeah. Uh, uh, when I was there, uh, back in 2021, you had a room where, you know, you had a show, um, in the room where it was, you know, yet, uh, Jewish, uh, you had Jewish individuals, you had Muslims, you had Christians, and they were being hosted by the French. And we know that, you know, French policies concerning, you know, Muslims when it comes to burqas and, and hijabs, or, or, you know, policies that are, uh, that are anti-Semitic. It's like, you know, wait a minute, like this is not supposed to be happening. This room should not be at all, but that's right. what art does. That's brings, the power of that, people together. Exactly. Exactly. That's the power of art. So, um, to be a part of this program, I think it's really, 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 um, really great in a number of ways, but, um, it, it allows me to extend my reach as an artist, because a lot of my work is primarily focused on, uh, telling stories sure, uh, and stories that most people may not be aware of. And, you know, having a work on display at a place that's, uh, that's different, that's outside of the U S and it's a piece that, you know, people may not be familiar with. It opens yeah, let's the door. Talk, let's talk about that. Yeah. Let's yeah. About, I mean, yeah. It opens it's the door for those conversations yeah. to take place. You yeah, know, it yeah. makes people curious and, you know, people, you know, may have their, 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 their thoughts or, or opinions and you share those with others. And it's like, it's really interesting what art can do. And sometimes when I'm at an exhibition and my work is on display, I don't even announce myself as the artist. I just stand yeah. there to listen to the conversations because you get the most authentic, you know, viewpoints and opinions, even if they're things that, you know, um, are, you may not agree with at all. I mean, you, you get to hear a lot of things, uh, about your work, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. So you're working on a piece for the art and the embassies program right now. Correct. So, um, and you're really big on exposing, uh, hidden, you know, figures and hidden narratives. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about that piece? Uh, so this piece is a portrait. Well, it's my interpretation of a, uh, long time, uh, character that was created by a Spanish poet in the uh, 16th century. Uh, so the, um, the figure is a, uh, legendary queen, mm -hmm. uh, named Calafia. Sure. Um, and she was a fictional African queen that ruled an Island called California. And it's widely believed that, um, that the state of California actually gets its name from that story. So this is my interpretation of that particular portrait. And, uh, I think it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty cool to learn that it was developed by a Spanish uh, poet because it's actually going to Madrid, Spain. So that should be an interesting, uh, icebreaker, uh, when the piece is there on display. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned earlier, you work with uh, fabric. Um, so you want to tell us a little bit about your process? Well, with, that uh, this piece, the, uh, so the fabric I mentioned earlier, it's a, uh, it's a parachute cloth. Um, and that's something that I use to, you know, um, paint on, uh, you know, when it comes to doing murals, if I'm working on something indoors and I want, I don't want to be at the mercy of the elements, you know, that's, um, that's my best bet. Um, mm -hmm. I don't get to work with it all the time because, you know, some people want things painted directly on the wall. But uh, when I do get to work on it, I mean, it's it's a really uh, it's a much smoother process. And then you get to install everything later on and see how everything pieces together. But uh, in terms of um, um, fabric, when it comes to costuming, um, something that I'm starting to see is that. Um, uh, fashion and costuming is starting to really make its way into my own work. Interesting. And the last several pieces I've created have been, you know, uh, the most notable things have been what the figures are wearing. You know, even my, uh, let's say my self portrait, I had this, uh, elaborate Italian paisley scarf, you know, that got a lot of attention. Uh, another piece I created before that, it was a portrait of a gentleman, um, who's a, uh, who's a huge, uh, fashion designer. He was, uh, designed, uh, he had, he designed, you know, clothes for the, uh, Mandela family, but how he was dressed, you know, in this, you know, white, uh, dinner jacket with this sash and black vest and, uh, the patterns on the, uh, on the sash and the patterns on his, um, um, on his, uh, um, um, Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm no, right. place. I mean, yeah. it looked it look regal, you know, very, <laughs> well, that's very, the very, thing. very, very royal. A lot of the figures that I've been painting as of late, they've been having this look of, uh, of, uh, regality, mm. you know, they've looked very, you know, just, um, uh, they look royal in, in, in a sense, you know, even sure. if they're just, you know, regular people, you know, they, yeah. they look that way. And, and, and for me as a, as an artist, especially as a portrait artist, I love giving people, uh, their dignity. 
you know, uh, de- depicting people in a way that makes them uh, makes them seem, you know, very uh, powerful, important, you know, uh, capturing their essence. And, you know, uh, lately the clothes that they wear have really, really added just this other effect to the to the work, you know. So uh, for this piece, uh, and we actually had a very short amount of time to actually put this piece together. My best friend was the uh, was the model for it. Uh, so I had like maybe 36 hours to put an entire costume together and um, found some things that I ordered on Amazon, mm-hmm. uh, but also, you know, went shopping in the garment district and in the fashion district uh, of uh, LA. And uh, yeah, I found, you know, multiple garments that really worked with the piece and, you know, uh, they they really really make the figure you know pop everything together makes the figure pop so uh in the portrait i mean you'll see all those things together and how it just makes this you know um it just it just gives this very very royal but very ancient look to her sure. so yeah that's that's incredible mm-hmm. now with uh young um artists and specifically young uh, black artists, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we're entering in really interesting time right now because of, you know, where technology is headed, right? You got yeah. VR, you got, you know, all these, you know, uh, new, t- n- new tools. We're not, we're not, we're not going to get into <laughs> NFTs. <laughs> it's an interesting time though. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. you know, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. It's this weird kind of uh, weird thing to witness because on one end mm-hmm. I have artist friends that see it as a golden opportunity. Sure. I have other friends that are, you know, they have reasons to feel threatened by what's, what's, what's happening. And, you know, especially those that are digital artists or digital illustrators, you know, yeah. there is cause for real concern. And it's over the fact that here is, uh, here's, uh, this, 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 you know, software that's now been developed where people don't even have to call upon artists anymore. And it's like, you know, it's, and that's a legit threat. You know, you you don't want to lose your lens, lens AI. Yeah. Lens had caused a huge stir in the uh, art community, uh, especially digital artists. I mean, it was, it was not taken well and for good reason, Mm -hmm. because, you know, it's, it's an app that's been developed. And although like, you know, it, it, there are some, some loopholes, it, you know, was, was able to, you know, go through in order to, you know, make the app, you know, um, um, make the app function in a way where it can't necessarily be sued. You know, Mm -hmm. you can't really sue them. Um, you can tell that they, they've taken, you know, a lot of that from, from actual artists, you know, and, uh, one thing, that artists fear is replacement and being replaced or eliminated altogether. But I don't care what anyone says, AI will not replace us. It cannot. I mean, because yeah. everything AR, AI still needs us in order to, you know, pull from that, you know, that, that huge archive and library in order to create, you know, you know, whatever, you know, we're, we're always going to be necessary. That's, so you remember that's my how thing. IBM did that whole thing with the chess champion. You know, <laughs> you know, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> you know, my, Microsoft might say, you know, machine versus Sean Michael Warren. No, okay. <laughs> I'll take that yeah. challenge. Yeah. A machine can't out imagine me. Okay. That's how I see it. You will not be able to out imagine me. You are software at the end of the day. And it's like, you know, there are, there are infinite things that artists, you know, can think of conceptually, you know, some things, oh, a lot of things we might not even really get to do in our lifetime at all. You know, it's like, you never know what we're thinking, you know? And that's the thing. It's like, you know, AI can create, yeah, it can create something that looks good but also it is missing the human element to it it is missing um that that uh that one thing that gives it character mm-hmm. um you, you're missing the personality of the artist in it you know I see. that's a signature yes yes yeah. and every artist has a signature and you can tell when it's not there you can tell when something has been generated some people are going to be fooled by it i mean come on i mean it's yeah, yeah. Some people have been fooled by it. There was actually yeah. a really big case. There was this art competition that happened. A person had actually submitted an AI generated piece and it won the competition and it pissed everybody off. It pissed off all the artists, you know. So there are some people that are gonna be fooled by it, but also too, they're gonna people they're gonna be people that think digital artists, you know, are um the 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 work that digital artists created were created by AI. You know, so it's 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 gonna be a strange time for a while. Yeah. So what's your advice um, for young artists that are just Oof. I think honestly we're going to end up back into a period where things that were done by hand is going to be 
exponentially valued even more now. I see. You know, things that were hand drawn, hand painted. Um, it's like that that skill is going to become even more valuable. And that's that's why I don't feel threatened by it. Sure. You know, it's just it's if anything, it's made us even more expensive. That's that's how I put it. You know, you look at, you know, when billboards became a thing, you know, hand painted advertisements was a thing, you know, for for a long time. And then, you know, you started making everything, you know, uh, in in Photoshop, you started designing things on on software, mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, people were still paying extra to have it hand painted or to have it, you know, hand drawn. Um, so I think we're going to end up back. Everything happens in cycles. That's just my opinion. Everything is going to end up back to that time frame where, you know, the hand drawn, hand painted things are going to be more valuable. So I would I would say to young artists, number one, learn how to draw. That is the foundation for for everything. Learn how to draw sketchbook, pencil, I mean, and dedicate, I would say dedicate a year or two just to drawing. I mean, so one thing that is really missing a lot, we've had a major wave of de-skilling that has gone on. You know, no one is really taught to properly draw anymore. I mean, you know, that's why I'm really, uh, I'm really grateful that there are ateliers out there that do commit to still teaching, even though it's considered ancient, in some cases they consider it dead, the art of drawing, being able yeah. to draw accurately, being able to draw, draw the figure. Um, that is, there, there are still, you know, institutions and ateliers out there that are dedicated to that. That's important. That's, Would that's you do really a important. master class? <sighs> Maybe. I mean, you talked about giving back, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it just, I know it takes a lot to, to, to yeah. put something together like that, but you know, yeah. um, and I, I have no problem sharing. What about, what about a workshop? My, I would do a workshop. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Do, I would definitely do a workshop, do a demonstration, um, you know, sit with students. It's the thing is over time. How many kids can I bring? How many kids? Ooh, <laughs> it had to be a small number. Okay. It had to be a small number. I would say maybe a dozen at okay. max. Yeah. Okay. A dozen at a time because <laughs> um, it's, it's harder when it's a bigger, a bigger uh, sure. group, you know? So, um, and I want to be able to spend one-on-one -on -one time because everybody learns differently. Everybody, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So being able to have that one-on-one -on -one time with each person is something that I do need to do. Um, but yeah, it can only happen in small clusters. I can't do like a large, you know. Uh, <laughs> we'll give you a human assistant. Okay. <laughs> that actually helps. That yeah. actually helps. Yeah. So, but yeah, um, I definitely do see myself teaching in some aspect later down the road. Once some things have kind of, uh, uh, once I've like fully been able to, you know, have some kind of order to how, you know, things are changing right now with, uh, with my career. Um, yeah, yeah. I would say I would definitely teach, you know, I would even, you know, consider being a professor, you know, adjunct maybe so I can still dedicate time to creating my own stuff. But for sure, I, do I would see do that. yourself staying in Chicago long term. Yes and no. Okay. Uh, I will always have a base here, but mm -hmm. I definitely want to live elsewhere as well. Um, Chicago will always be home. My heart is here. Uh, Chicago, I think sometimes is overlooked in the amount of talent that is here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be tapped into at some point, hopefully in the future. Um, but you know, a lot of innovation has come out of Chicago creatively, yeah. you know, in art in music, uh, in, in, um, in, in literature, uh, in theater. Um, so yeah, I, I, I see Chicago as a, as a, as a breeding ground for uh enormous talent there are so many talented people that have come from so here here's something funny recently i've been seeing all these hoodies um fear of god you know mm. essentials and i'm like oh that's interesting and then i, I paid it no attention and then i <laughs> kept on seeing it you know mm. even even more and then i was like let me look into this right and mm. it's like oh okay the founder is jerry lorenzo it's like oh mm. interesting mm. look him up even some more he has a degree from Loyola University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and some of the most And it's only because people. of one tweet when they were going to that uh, final four, you know, championship yeah. run. He made a tweet. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But for me, it's like if kids on the south side and west side, you know, knew that. Mm -hmm. Most people have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing we are motivated by is seeing people that look like us dominating in a field, whether that's sports, whether that is in music, cuisine. Virgil Abaloa. Yeah. 
Virgil, Virgil Abloh was uh, was very revolutionary. You know, to see someone, you know, enter into um, uh, that seat with, you know, a brand like Louis Vuitton, you know, to be in uh, over the entire creative culture of Louis Vuitton was was incredible to see. So, you know, we've we've had a boatload of talent from here. Virgil was and these are like I'm talking about game changers that we've yeah. had come out of Chicago. You know, we have Kerry James Marshall here. We have Theaster Gates here. We have, you know, we had Virgil Abloh and then music. You know, you look at all the music artists that have come out of Chicago and that have influenced, right. you know, the world, you know, so Chicago will always be uh the Apple's hub on the map yeah. because of the iPod. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's there's a direct you know correlation between the success of you know modern day technology and mm -hmm. art and you know cultural, yeah. right? Yeah, you know, so you got absolutely. The rapper that passed away, you know, DMX. Mm. You know, he gets his name from a machine that he used, mm. right? Yeah, Drum, the drumming machine, mm. right? Yeah. So that being said, you know, Sean, how can people reach you? Ah, so they can follow me on Instagram at Warren Art, W-A-R-R-E-N-A-R-T. Uh, that is primarily where, you know, I, I keep a lot of my work. Yeah. Um, it, it's more of my work than it is me, but I sure. think slowly I would start to show myself more. But uh, <laughs> that's my primary um, that's my primary uh, uh, social media handle. I would also say LinkedIn, you know, Sean Michael Warren. Uh, that's another, and it's S H A W N, the correct uh, way to spell Sean. Hold on, you're an artist, you use LinkedIn. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. You need to use LinkedIn. LinkedIn does not get uh, the the uh, the credit it deserves, and LinkedIn is often overlooked. Um, but no, I recommend artists, you know, be on LinkedIn as well. Uh, you, you open yourself up to a huge network of people. And my, my, uh, one of the things I always advise young artists to do is to meet people that have nothing to do with what you do at all. Um, say that one more time, <laughs> meet people and connect with people that have nothing to do with what you do as an artist. And I, I've, I notice a lot of artists tend to just, you know, commune with artists, you know, that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, which is, you know, I get it. That's your community. You know, yep. you need that support, but you know, um, I would say befriend and network with C-suite executives, you know, in, in finance, you know, people in the corporate world, you never know what those relationships can lead to. Uh, go to, go to galas that have nothing to do with art, you know, go to charity events, go to, you know, this event, that event. I mean, just be open to, uh, attending things that have nothing to do with you at all. You know, you'd be surprised at what you come across. And that's something I did. And it's why I've been able to build a network that I do have of people that you wouldn't even imagine <laughs> an artist would have in their contacts. So yeah, yeah, that's my bit of advice. And LinkedIn is a really great tool for that. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Chicago is a great city to do that and absolutely ne network, you know, you just hop absolutely. on, just hop on yeah. the CTA. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. For yeah. sure. You, you never know who you come across and Chicago, uh, is such a small world. You never know who knows who, yeah. you know? Um, so yeah, yeah. That's so awesome, I love man. this city a lot, man. I mean, I'm born and raised here, the city will always be near and dear to my heart. And there, there are parts of this city and elements of this city that uh, no other place can compare. Yeah, at absolutely. All. At I mean, all. I wasn't born here, but mm. it's my adopted um, home, mm -hmm. and I'm blessed to be here for a long time. You know, so I, it's gonna be you know home for me. But like you, mm -hmm. definitely gonna be uh, traveling. You know, uh, quite a bit. But uh, Sean, I just want to thank you, man, for yeah, coming man. in on the show. You know episode you know one mm -hmm. you know before we end it the title is shut up and paint shut up <laughs> <laughs> so we got yeah i we know a lot it, of we, people we, we that wish it, we would do that yeah you know? we, we gotta give a shout out to where where the title came out from oh you mean the uh the whole shut up and dribble bit that was told to lebron i yeah. can't remember who told him that but that was <laughs> it was somebody from fox but we're not gonna we're not gonna dwell on that we're not we're not but no um i know there are a lot of people that wish we would just shut up and paint you know they're yeah um anytime we you know want to have our own voice even just in in our world you know in the art world you know anytime we want to have a voice or dare speak up oh man the uh the 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 backlash and the the egos and the and the craziness that goes on when an artist dare speaks up for himself or speaks up for other artists it's it's interesting it's very interesting it's an interesting hierarchy in the art world 
Um, I wish the artists were not at the bottom of the totem pole. Um, if, if anything, it should be artists at the top and then, you know, it's support and then, you know, everything else after that. But yeah, maybe we can, maybe we can change that. You know, we'll, I think you're going to change that. It cannot be an individual effort at all. Okay. It's going to have to take multiple people over time. It's going to be, have, it's going to have to be a generational thing for sure. Awesome, yeah. man. Well, I do appreciate you coming on the show and, you know, I hope, uh, you know, the next guest listens to this episode before they come on, you know, so they can be, you know, inspired and, you mm -hmm. know, we can keep these rich conversations uh, going. For you know? sure. So, yeah. And good luck to you and everything, man. All thank the you. best. Thank you. Appreciate that. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for uh, listening to our uh, podcast today with the incredible artist, Sean Michael Warren. Make sure to follow us on uh, social media. We got more content uh, coming up and more exciting guests.